Good morning, David, and thanks to ICRS to organize this very nice virtual meeting. And I would like to start immediately with the presentation of uh, Sherman, Dr. Seth. So you Thank speak you. about anatomic and biomechanical preservation regarding the shoulder, correct? Excellent. So you can see my screen. I'll get started here. So uh, it's an honor, honor to be with everyone uh, this evening. It's getting late here in America. So, um, but never too late to talk about joint preservation. Uh, here we'll talk about the shoulder. My disclosures are readily accessible online. My task here is really to set the stage for what is an incredible lineup uh, and cast of characters. Uh, as you'll see, uh, we're going to hit a broad range of topics in a lot of detail. So I'm going to take a 10,000 foot view here for a couple of minutes. Um, you know, I think the major concepts here are the same as all of the other joints that we'll see in every module. However, the key players in the shoulder are different and the goals and expectations of our patients and our athletes are different. Like the other joints, the shoulder joint is an organ. We must think of it as an organ system made up of osseous restraints, dynamic and static stabilizers. And then lastly, thinking about those uh, influences on the cartilage surface itself. The shoulder has some of the greatest demands of any joint in the body, as we can see from these various different examples. But not only there in our athletic endeavors, but even in daily life in our occupation or around the house, we're using the shoulder in intricate ways. We can think about the extremes of motion, angular velocity, the fastest ever recorded when we're talking about pitching athletes. And these demands are extreme. Adaptive changes, repetition, turns into micro trauma, which turns into cumulative pathology uh, for this joint over time. It's really a delicate balance between mobility and stability more than any other joint in the body. I love this slide. It really gives us a sense of the range of pathology based not only on age, but on mechanism of injury, and then also on kind of activity uh, level and uh, you know taking it down to a joint level. So really in these young patients, we're thinking labral tears, instability, then we move into AC joint biceps, maybe adhesive capsulitis towards rotator cuff and then arthritis as we get on the opposite end of the spectrum. It's critical like in other joints, not to treat the MRI, but to treat the patient. We can find multiple examples in the shoulder about asymptomatic uh, shoulders with superior labrum tears. We can see asymptomatic rotator cuff tears. If you want to find reasons to think about doing something in a shoulder and a thrower, just get an MRI and you'll see all sorts of pathology that may or may not be relevant. So that's a very, very important point here. Let's go through these restraints one by one. So the osseous restraints, we're really talking about the humerus and the glenoid. We're looking at things such as humeral retroversion, how that's influenced during development, development and how that may um, be implicated as we talk about joint preservation and arthritis. Similarly, we think about glenoid version, we can measure version. This has implications for risk factors for instability in the young population and arthritis as we age. We think about glenoid morphology, certainly if we're looking about matching uh, humerus uh, and glenoid uh, bone or for arthritis with metal and plastic, this is critically important. We think about the shoulder being a golf ball on a golf tee. If you have recurrent or repetitive instability, you can have attritional bone loss. And when you get to a critical value, that golf ball cannot stay on that golf tee. And so we must really recognize this critical bone loss similar to the concept of the inverted pair, which is really loss of that inferior aspect of the glenoid as you see here. And we think about that orange peel, which is really that very large and engaging hill sacs defect. We have wonderful and time-tested treatments such as the Latarge as you see here, or more novel treatments that we're gonna hear about the distal tibial allograft um, and how that um, has really uh, come into uh, vogue with regard to restoring both cartilage uh, and bone stock uh, within the shoulder joint. For the very extreme engaging hill sacs, you can also perform osteochondral allograft transplantations, as we'll go into later in the session. Moving towards those static stabilizers, we really have to point out the importance of the labrum. It deepens the glenoid by 50%. It's attached to multiple ligaments of varying functions, 
The most important for our young athletes really is this inferior glenohumeral ligament that acts sort of as a hammock to help with stabilization. We think about the joint as an organ and we must be able to recognize and treat labrum and capsular issues in these younger patients in particular um, if we're going to address um, all of their concomitant pathology as you see here. On the other extreme, we have to recognize capsular tightness, internal rotation deficits, as this is associated with pain and injury within the shoulder. We can get partial undersurface rotator cuff tears. We can have uh, issues with the superior labrum biceps complex, uh, as you see in these representative images and photos. And we must recognize and treat this uh, non-operatively um, Posterior capsular tightness um, can uh, be treated as you see here with sleeper stretches or genie stretches or a host of other um, interventions that can only make us better in any of the treatment options that we're discussing uh, here later in joint preservation. Recognizing for the shoulder who has general ligamentous laxity and who has specific shoulder joint laxity. And as is super important, really uh, understanding the difference between someone who is asymptomatic laxity versus pathologic multidirectional instability two different entities uh, that one is pathology that may need to be treated and one is just a variant of normal that needs to be recognized. The scapulothoracic joint is really our core for the upper extremity. We need to recognize a sick scapula, which is malpositioned, inferior medial border prominence, coracoid pain and malposition, dyskinesia of scapular movement. This constellation must be corrected as well non-surgically if you're going to try to optimize the joint environment for any joint preservation. And so we think about the kinetic chain, core to floor rehabilitation, periscapular strengthening, pec minor stretching, proprioception, neuromuscular control, consistent themes that must come up in all of our rehabilitation to make us look good when we're doing joint preservation type surgery. We think about the rotator cuff and the biceps complex, the stabilizing effect of joint compression. Uh, this is working through the mid-range of motion, whereas the static ligaments are working more in the extremes. We think about uh, the uh, cuff cable complex and the implications for stress distribution about the rotator cuff. It's interesting to really um, think about degeneration, uh, chicken and the egg, is it genetics? Uh, is it environment or a combination uh, thereof? Um, we know for rotator cuffs, there's really no one size fits all tear. That goes for patients, that goes for tear patterns, that goes for MRI findings, which can range from normal to atrophy, to variety of fat infiltration uh, and the ramifications for this for each of our individual patients. And that translates into treatments. There's no one size fits all treatment. You can see huge differences, partial tears, repairable full thickness tears, massive tears, uh, and then uh, novel uh, techniques and arthroplasty. So really uh, runs the whole gamut. Um, there's a huge challenge for rotator cuff healing. This is the most evident for larger tears and older patient populations. And I think a wonderful opportunity as we'll hear about for biologic augmentation. There have been studies that will be reviewed on PRP augmentation. There are other studies looking at medicinal signaling cells for rotator cuff repair that we'll review in detail. And then really hearing about other novel surgical interventions such as superior capsular reconstruction for these massive and irreparable rotator cuffs. Lastly, we think about the cartilage. The thickness here is much smaller than the knee joint. However, it is thickest centrally, uh, typically about 1.2 to 1.5 millimeters. The humerus in general is equal to the glenoid. And interestingly and important, if we're going to size match um, uh, and match morphology, we need to look at the radius of curvature of the humerus, which is different than the radius of curvature of the glenoid and recognize that certainly if we're looking for uh, tissue options for restoration. When we're thinking about focal defects, we can look at the literature and uh, this will be reviewed by colleagues about um, the possible use of microfracture. Is there a role for partial head resurfacing? And then moving towards arthritis variants. There's a whole slew of different arthritis variants, such as post-traumatic arthritis um, or um, capsulography arthritis, as you see here. This is standard osteoarthritis. And then we have cuff tear arthropathy. And 
Each of those can have different treatment options. We'll review the injection and biologic injection options uh, for osteoarthritis and other arthritis. We'll think about the use of arthroscopy for capsular releases and perhaps removal of the osteophytes. We'll challenge and review the literature looking at glenoid resurfacing options, whether there is a role at all uh, in 2020 for this treatment. Um, and then uh, we will cover lastly, uh, the broad range of arthroplasty options for the younger and the aging uh, athlete. And I think what's exciting about this type of forum is that there's more questions than answers. And we'll hopefully as a group come up with innovative solutions to these complex problems over time. So I hope in this relative whirlwind tour, I've showed you, I've uh, uh, showed you that the shoulder joint is really an organ system. It's made up of osseous restraints, dynamic and static stabilizers, and then the cartilage surfaces. There's this really delicate balance between stability and mobility, and there's really no one-size-fits-all solution for these very tough problems. And many opportunities for biologic intervention. And so now I will turn it over to my colleagues uh, to continue with more specific uh, treatment options uh, for each of these entities. And thank you very much for your attention.